The following program may contain strong language and brief nudity. But don't get your hopes up. After all, this is Public Access TV. This program was made possible from the support of VSA Texas. And Amira Group. I'm Gene. And I'm Dave. And we're the Gene Gene and and Dave Dave Show. Hi folks, man, I am excited about today. We have, we have something special today. That's right. We're yeah, we're going to talk about like um w- what makes me keep going. Yeah. And what makes other people keep going. What is your passion? What gets you up in the morning? What is it you can't live without? Uh, we've we've interviewed a couple of folks that have some really interesting stories. We do. I mean, my passion is just getting up and being on screen and and doing this show and other movies and TV shows, I just I get a rush out of it, and I can't wait to get up in the morning when that happens. And, and I'm that way with traveling in different forms, <laughs> uh, either doing the traveling or writing stories about them. So we found our passions, and folks, if, if you don't have a passion, go out and find one because it, it, it's, it's really life-changing having a passion you can embrace. Yeah, and speaking of life-changing, I think... Uh, we're going to have Virginia Rose come in, and her passion started when she was really, really young and um, happened to be bird watching. So let's, let's go talk to Virginia. <laughs> well, we like to have fun on the Gene and Dave show, and that's why we invited Virginia here. I um, was introduced to Virginia at the St. David's uh, SCI support group. Uh, held over there at St. David's Hospital. And Virginia was talking about bird watching. And it was pretty obvious that Virginia was very passionate about this subject. So, Virginia, tell us a little about yourself and how you got into bird watching. All righty. Well, I think I came by it honestly in that my grandmother was a bird watcher. Uh, She walked all up and down Lamar from 1930 to 1995. Wow. Um, I have her first edition bird book, which is a treasure. Um, And my parents were both very much into identifying everything around them, rocks, stars, trees, flowers, birds. Wow. So there were field guides open all over the house growing up. (laughs) So I think with all those things in place, it was inevitable that I would finally end up being a birder. And um, I joined Travis Audubon after I attended a lecture at the Unitarian Church. And the lecture was about the breeding success of the house finch. (laughs) Anyway, from then on, I took all the birding classes at Travis Audubon and began leading the beginning bird walks at Travis Audubon. Wow. And I did that for seven years. And now I'm on the board of directors for Travis Audubon. And honestly, I have to thank them because all of those classes ended with field trips. And the field trips were where I really found my freedom cool. on the trail. Um, the leaders never said no to me. They took me everywhere they went. If we had to manhandle over logs, we did that. Mm -hmm. If we had to perch precariously on bridges out in the middle of the forest, we did that. But they never failed to take me right along with them. And that's when I realized there's so much I can do outside. Um, And then I just started birding with a passion and decided last March to do my very first birdathon 
Okay. And that's one of the fundraising events at Travis Audubon. What, what is a birdathon? A birdathon is uh, an event that uh, can be a number of people running it, and mm. um, those people all get together and go to a certain spot on a certain day at a certain time, and they see as many birds as they possibly can in that time period and space. And then they document that? And they document it. Okay. And then um, if we have 10 teams, people all support their teams financially. Mm -hmm. And so those end up being really fun times and nice fundraisers too. So I thought I'll have my own. And so I decided what I would do is uh, go to five accessible parks and I would bird from dawn to dusk and I would see as many birds as I could in that amount of time. From dawn to from, dusk? From dawn to dusk I birded. I went to five parks in, it, it in is one in, day. In one day? Yes. Wow. Yes. So, so tell me, uh, you mentioned the field trips yes. that you went on. Yes. And now you're talking about going to the parks. Yes. And, and you are a person that uses a wheelchair. Right. So to me, that's like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I get out to the park and I can usually get to the parking lot. Right. And then yeah. that's where it stops. Well, yep. right. So and you I'm, found some parks yes, that you I'm, can get through. I'm very glad you um, reminded me of this. In the last 15 years, with all the field trips that I've done with Travis Audubon, I've made a list of every accessible park. There are 35 of them in wow. the Austin area. Awesome. Okay. I didn't and even I keep, know we had 35 parks. <laughs> right? And so we have 35 parks that are accessible, which I know no one knows that, and they wouldn't know it. Right. Unless someone like me had sort of spearheaded that search. So now that list is on Travis Audubon under my, my page, which is called Birdability. And, then and the I, address is right here at the bottom of the yes, screen. Yes, and Birdability. Birdability.com is my blog. Okay. And um, TravisAudubon.org also has access to Birdability events and the access to the parks. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. That'll be something that people can, can look check. up and enjoy and can check well, it out. Yeah. What I realized was that it had been such an important and enriching part of my life for the last 15 plus years. I realized people don't know they can do it. Mm -hmm. They just don't know. And what I've realized is you don't know if a place is accessible, and you guys probably understand this, you, go, you don't know if a place is truly accessible for you right. until you go. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell you. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. For That's sure. Right? right? And so as soon... Because electric wheelchairs can be different than manual right? wheelchairs. Exactly, yeah. And manual chairs are different with a smart drive. And so oh, there are right. all, wow. these, all these little things that make your world accessible that nobody can know. And so my motto sort of is, you don't know until you go. Mm -hmm. But I realized, I think, that a lot of people stop themselves before going mm -hmm. because they're the not fear. sure. Of the fear of, oh, I'm going to get I'm there. Not I'm gonna, not going to be able to get around. But and with, with good reason, too. A lot of us, yes. we make reservations at a hotel. They say they're yes. accessible. We go there and find they're not. So Exactly. So we've kind of grown up with this fear. Right. But, but you're saying... To find out for sure, just go. You just go. Just do it. You just go and you figure it out. And it's, to me, this is the most important part of it, Gene, is that what happens when you go to a place where you've never been and you don't really know how much you can do mm -hmm. and you manage it that day, you come home with a different feeling about yourself. Yeah. Yes. You come home sure. with a feeling of, I figured that out, and it is hugely empowering. And if you start stacking up those little experiences mm -hmm. one after another, you fill yourself with a sense of confidence and a sense of can do, and even more than that, a sense of wanting to share with other mm -hmm. people your experience. And so that's really where birdability came about. So but you you've got to get out to do that. You yep. just have to do it, you and you have, have to, to trust get out. Yeah, even that you can do some of it sure or maybe all of it 
maybe it's just going out in your own front yard or backyard, just getting out of your house. And Absolutely. Then yeah, the next yeah. step. Then right. Go to well, now you were talking about access on the trails before, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So you sent us a picture of one trail. Now this, this you can see is a nice smooth sidewalk through the park. But some, you've been on some rough trails. I have. It, it, tell us about some of your roughest. Um, there's a beautiful place to bird in Austin called Commons Ford. And it is not at all set up for wheelchairs. Okay. But um, in my zest for following along with the people on the field trip, <laughs> I just followed along. You went ahead. I did. <laughs> I, and uh, I remember the one of the very first times I went to Commons Ford, we... It was like 20 degrees, it was freezing. I don't know why we were all out, but we're all bundled up and everybody was walking down this really beautiful, frosty covered grassy hill. That was, you know what it looks oh. like when grass is totally frosted over? Yeah. And it was beautiful and, and I thought, well, I'm not gonna not go. And so I just pulled a wheelie and just kind of went down the whole hill oh, wow. <laughs> with them. And I looked behind and I saw my wheels in the frost yeah. Like behind me, and I thought that is so cool. That you know that I was making my own. Did you tracks. take a picture of that? I didn't. Oh my gosh! Just Sorry. in your in your I know, mind. In my in my mind, and so I followed along Commons Ford these trails, all along, no sidewalks anywhere, um, deep grass, and it was very strenuous and difficult. But I saw all the birds that everybody else saw, and then at the end of the trip, there was this huge hill down to, to end the trip to get to our cars and I was perched on the top of that hill and I thought <laughs> uh oh <laughs> now I've done it but that's what I do is I just go 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 and I don't think about the getting back or <laughs> I never think about the getting yeah. back I just think about the going forward you, yeah you're right right Keep your eyes on the prize and the prize is getting exactly there. and it, and I'll, I guess I just have this feeling like I'll figure it out like whatever it is I will figure it out. That's so you so build up all the confidence. So by... yeah, exactly. And you, do, you you don't get the confidence from doing the easy stuff. That doesn't, you know, it's Good like point. I used to tell my students, I taught for 28 years. Like I tell my students, why would you get any confidence from learning something you already knew mm. or writing a poem that wasn't difficult for you? That's what's... Yeah. There's no empowerment there. Right. So you, you're not going to get the good feeling from the easy. You yeah, only, some people say you don't learn from successes. You learn from failures. Well, and or struggles, I oh, like to okay. say. That's struggles. Because I definitely end up in predicaments where now I'm like, now what am I going to do? I have to call a neighbor. I'm stuck in my yard. You know, but sometimes <laughs> sure. that happens. But I got to the top of this hill, and I thought, and all my friends, all my walking friends were gathered around. And they're like, what can we do to, to help you? And I said, really, there's nothing you can do. I'm just going to have to pull a wheelie and just wheelie down this really steep hill until I get to the bottom. And everyone's like, ugh. But and I've if never, I fall, somebody come pick me up. Right, but <laughs> I've, I've never fallen okay. with them. And so they all just believe I could do it. So I just, you know, popped the wheelie mm. and then just managed my way down the hill and got to the bottom. And then I turned around said, someone take a picture of me with yeah, this yeah. steep hill behind me. There you go. So, and they were all white, frozen were, with fear, <laughs> right? Well, I, yeah. It's, what is Virginia doing What this is she time? doing now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But for the most part, the um, parks that I've identified as accessible don't have all that. They have beautiful, wide, well-graded sidewalks that you can manage for miles. So someone in an electric wheelchair. Yes, someone maybe. in a someone in an electric someone in a um, on a walker. Oh. I'm thinking every mobility mm -hmm. challenged person um, can do these bird walks. So what kind of equipment does it take to be a bird? Binoculars. Watcher? Binoculars. Right, okay. and that's all I've had for 15 years. Oh wow! Okay. A pair of binoculars and and your guidebook and your guidebook, but now it's all on apps on your phone. Okay, so oh. it's on your phone. and the bird sounds and songs are on the phone. Okay, so I had my first bird ability walk um, October thirteenth, I think, and there were six people um, there, two of whom were in wheelchairs, mm -hmm. one of whom mm -hmm. had never birded before, and so I was thrilled, and I didn't know her. 
And so this is exactly what I'm trying to do, is to find these mobility challenged people and get them on a trail. And I brought 12 pairs of binoculars and field guides just Whoa. in case that many people needed learners. Very nice. Okay. And we birded for about two and a half, three hours. Everybody had a great time. Everyone got on birds. The um, There was a Texas Parks and Wildlife journalist there mm -hmm. and a uh, a cameraman and they said that um, well the the journalist emailed me later and said it was so much fun that I went and bought little kid binoculars for my kids and <laughs> I'm gonna get them started on birding right away Fantastic. Look what you okay yes yeah, yes exactly that's the whole point so you were so passionate about this you shared it with other folks right and now now it's just growing now you've created yes. more passion and yeah. i went and presented at rehab without walls okay which is have you heard of rehab without walls I've, with st david's i've heard of them but refresh my memory what? okay it's a therapy that is sort of on site of wherever the client likes to spend his or her time okay so i like to spend my time on trails birding so that's where the therapists met me for my therapy oh okay now you know it may be bowling for someone else but mm -hmm. that's where the therapists will meet their client well, that makes a lot of sense it's so authentic and when you think about making sure that you're doing something you love as you're exercising mm -hmm. or as you're it's helping and passion. healing your body yeah Jeez. you're much I think Gene's therapist would have to meet him at the beer garden. Yes. <laughs> to exercise the beer <laughs> myself. To pay for my beer. Yes. yes. To pay for my medication. Uh, see, he immediately thought of it in financial terms. Right, yeah. Instead of... Instead of the therapy. Well, instead of maybe that isn't where he should be meeting his therapist. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so I anyway know him well that's where he would go Definitely. yeah but you're still here people choose their friends <laughs> that's right <laughs> anyway so um i'm leading a rehab without walls walk oh cool on the 14th of this month or of november well that's incredible that sounds like a whole and the other therapists show too. are coming with wow. their clients nice so the idea is to just ripple it out to as many different places as it as it can be all right and I, I i will tell you my dream my like final dream of this or ultimate i should say is that i put together a um, mobility impaired birding team i would like to have a team of like seven or eight people who are mm -hmm. mobility impaired who bird regularly with me maybe once a month and maybe we go out of town and to other really wonderful places in texas to bird and then we get a team in Dallas. So there's a, let's say there's a mobility impaired team in Dallas or a mobility impaired birding team in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And we invite that team to Austin to bird in all the 35 places here that we know of. Okay, and then you go and to And then place. Seattle oh, wow, wow. hosts us because they've already scoped out all the birding places in Seattle. Because otherwise I'd go to Seattle and spend three weeks trying to find the places that are accessible oh, but they've so already done it a lot of sense. so do you see what i'm saying it's like i would like to yeah. see this mobility impaired team all across the country and create these hosting networks right and just all imagine right. how cool that would be it'd be very cool i know well i can't wait to get home and i'm going to check out your blog yes check out the blog and I just find out more about you and watching birds and yes and i'm then, gonna i'm gonna come hunt you down and I, and go birding with you I, sometime I, it's I'm excited. really really fun and i will tell you the the last sort of feather in the cap right now is that i found out that the rio grande valley birding festival which is um held in the harlingen area um it's one of the biggest birding festivals in the country and I just found out that they have now a mobility impaired walk for those clients. Oh, wow. It's the first one I know about, and I'm going to be co leading. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's the first one that I've led, and I'm so thrilled that the Rio Grande Valley has been really the first one to pick it up. And you're a leader in this area. And yes, so it's, it's growing. Very exciting. I do have one picture to show you. This is a picture of uh, black vultures okay. that we have here in Austin. And the reason it's significant to me is I grew up in Cleveland where we have Buzzard Sunday in the spring of every year. 
And the rumor is that in 1898, there was a horrible winter. It froze all these cattle to death, and they all thawed out at about the same time. Oh. And when they did, buzzards came from all over in that spring. And so they've been returning to Hinkley, Ohio ever since around mid-March. So it's wow. a big deal in Cleveland, and um, glad to see black buzzards here. <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely do their duty. Yeah, yes, they do what they're supposed to do. And thank goodness. Quite gross, but yes. That's, <laughs> yeah. They do their job. That's what they're there for, right? They do. So, Virginia, thank you so much for being on our show. And uh, people will be checking out your website. I know uh, I checked out your blog, and I'll be back to that as well. Oh, great. I hope yeah. to see you birding. It makes it all the better. So get out there and look at some birds, folks. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Virginia. Well, that was quite a story she had. But I don't know about getting up that early to go <laughs> bird watching. <laughs> That's going to be tough for you, isn't it? it well, it maybe is. you can watch the birds in the evening because I know <laughs> that they, they come out then too. So, or, you know, we could mount a camera on your chair and I could, I could see it from my computer. Just vicariously yes, see the birds. Yeah. I think you, I, I think the whole point is you getting out there oh. and seeing them, Gene, <laughs> and right. not just sit around in your apartment all day. <laughs> You're right. Now speaking of sitting around. Here's one guy that doesn't sit around. Oh, no. No. He's running. He's running. <laughs> William Greer, who works at the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities. Uh, William is a runner. Right. And we see runners all the time in Austin, <laughs> right? Yes, but... Running marathons, triathlons, whatever. Exactly. But William is legally blind. <laughs> what? <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so how does he see to run? I mean, he's got a cane, or yeah. Let's let's hear in William's own words. Okay, here's William. William, uh, I've known you for a number of years, but I never knew about this interesting passion you have. Tell us what it is and how you got started. Well, it's running, and I I initially started. Oh, 2005, I started running again. And I never thought I would enter a 5K until I heard about the Peace of Mind 5K, which was to raise money to help uh, returning veterans from Iraq with head injuries. And that was important to me for a couple of reasons. I had an open skull wound when I was 17, so head injury is important and my brother is in the army and he has been stationed in Iraq more than once so I said I've got to enter this 5k for that reason and I wound up loving it so I started entering more 5k's and then a 10k and eventually I entered a half marathon and I now, thought before we go any further now the head injury you had when you were 17 did that affect your vision? Yes, that is why I'm legally blind. Can you give our viewers a uh, an understanding of what what you can see or can't see? I have no peripheral vision on my right side and poor peripheral vision on the left side. I do not see well enough to read. And it's hard for me to recognize people. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I cannot see, and it's hard to say exactly what I can see or cannot see. But there's a lot of stuff that I can't see. And so how, do, how does that affect your running? Because I imagine, I mean, I wouldn't want to run off the uh, edge of something or down steps or uh, I would think I'd be kind of afraid to run with, with poor vision but you seem to manage that all right. It really is not that difficult. Um, I typically either run around a track at a school that's close to my apartment or I just run down uh, Lamar to the hike and bike trail and follow that and Usually it's no problem at all. Occasionally I will trip over something and fall. It happens every once in a while. 
I would say every three to six months, there will be something I don't see on the ground, and it'll make me hit the pavement. Um, and the last Cap 10K I was in, I entered it, got in touch with uh, someone at the School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and we got 10 students from the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired to enter this race with us. And one of the girls who was in the race wound up falling over because she is almost totally blind, can see nothing. And a little child who was four or five years old decided to run across the race course without thinking about it. And of course, the blind girl couldn't see her, so she hit the child and wound up hitting the ground. And she felt pretty awful because it also scared the child and the uh. child ran off and she couldn't apologize to the kid and say, I'm sorry about this. But, but still you getting others with visual impairments out running. So you're doing not only a good thing for yourself, but for the community as well. Yes. So then you started, you ran a 5K, that's five kilometers, which is what? 3.2 uh, miles. 3.2 miles. And from there, what did you do? Then, let's see, my first 5K, after that one I was in the Austin Bat Run, and then I was in a 10K, and I thought I will never be in a marathon. And then I was in the Decker Challenge Half Marathon, and I said, oh, I can finish this. I'll try a marathon. So I was in the Austin Marathon, the 2000. 10 Austin Marathon for my first marathon and I felt, well I won't say I felt fine, but I thought, oh this is no problem up to mile 18. Mile 18 I said, okay this hurts a little bit, but I can finish this. Is that when you started to hit the wall so to speak? Mile 23 is the wall where you supposedly can't stop. I hit mile 23 and I said, wow what do you mean the wall? This is no problem, I can finish this. And somewhere between 24 and 25, it started hurting really bad, and I had to walk a little bit. But by mile 25, I was running again, and I finished the marathon running. And I was sore, but I enjoyed it so much that I said, I can't wait till my next marathon. You, <laughs> so you, you finished it, and you were looking forward to your next Looking forward to the next one. So does it give you a sort of high or, or what uh, I mean what does it feel like I mean that's it's obviously a great accomplishment there is something about the natural rhythm of running that feels good and that you really enjoy and there's also something special that goes on in marathons in the San Antonio marathon they had cheerleaders from local high schools at various mile markers and at first I thought oh cheerleaders I mean, who cares? No big deal. But then I was approaching the first one, and I heard them cheering, 3.2, just around the corner. 3.2, oh. just around the corner. And it was really, really good. And I started looking forward to the next cheerleaders because it really did make a difference. And the only thing I regret was that they didn't have cheerleaders between mile 23 and 26. <laughs> And there's always funny things going on at every marathon. And San Antonio, I had a certain point, and they said, ah, oh, it says mile 24. I thought, oh, great, it's two miles to go, I can do this. Then I went around the corner, and I saw a sign saying mile 22. That made me really upset because it's only four miles, but why are you going to tell me it's mile 24? when there's still more than four miles to go. Yeah, yeah. That uh, it felt really good. So I finished that marathon. Um, felt better than I did after the Austin Marathon. No stopping at all. And so I, I said, I'm ready for the you next marathon. You kept moving the whole 26 miles. You do take breaks occasionally. I don't know anyone who doesn't have to stop and go to the restroom two or three times in a marathon. Well, you've got to, yeah, and you have to stay hydrated the whole time, too. Um, 
there were two things I did differently for my second marathon. You know, there was one thing I did differently for my second marathon. And every marathon, I get water every mile. They have people handing out cups of water on a mile basis. The other thing, well, the one thing I did differently was I carried some gel packs for food with me. And so every two or three miles, I would open up a gel pack and have some food. It's just a little protein and energy. and It made a tremendous difference. Fantastic. Uh, so you originally got started with that, that 5K and, and just, would, would it be fair to say you just fell in love with running? Just I just fell in love. Well, I was in love with running for two years before I was in a marathon. But after the first 5K, I got addicted to races, and I just had to be in more and more marathons. Well, you've been in a number of uh, races, 5Ks, whatever, 10Ks, and marathons. Tell us about some of your most memorable moments. Well... One of them was finishing my first 5K because I never thought I would want to be in a race, but after that it felt really good, and so I decided I've got to keep doing this. Uh, the second one was finishing my first marathon because even though it really hurt, it all, I also found it very enjoyable and I just felt I had to keep going. There are a number of medals that I've one and I don't remember the exact race but before I won a third place I came in fifth place in one race and that was really big for me because I thought fifth fifth place in my age group wow maybe I could move up and win a third or a second place another big memory was from the last Austin Marathon and it wasn't for me running it in particular, although that was a lot of fun. It was at the end, my wife was waiting for me at the finish line, and she said that at the end of the race, there were some people who were collapsing. There was one person who literally collapsed, couldn't move anymore, had to be carried off to the paramedics. And then there was one person who collapsed, and the two runners in front of him turned around, came back, and picked him up and helped him walk across the finish line. Uh, things like that feel really good because, well, that's memorable because, yes, everyone's competing and you want to do well, but it's also a very cooperative sport. You want to work with people, and if you see someone else is having trouble, you want to cooperate and help the person out. So another, another very memorable moment, it's not a good memory, but I was in the uh, Congress Avenue mile. I thought, oh, let's see how fast I can run a mile. Never going to do that again because it's too fast and it's too short. It takes me a mile to get warmed up. <laughs> I broke a six-minute mile for that, but it hurt and it was too fast and too short. And that's just... Not really fun. Not fun. It didn't do anything for you. And it showed me that I need to be at least a 5K before I can do something that feels good. So in the, the 5Ks and the, in the longer races, uh, even though there were some that you finished in the top five, the important thing is really finishing and the uh, perhaps camaraderie with the other runners who are all in it together. Yes. That's fantastic. This, you want to go faster than people, but you're cooperating with them. I remember at one of the 5Ks I was in at the Domain, and when I finished, someone came up to me and talked with me afterwards and said, wow, you were going really fast. And I said, not as fast as you. You were really pushing it. And he said, oh, no, we were both going really fast. So. Yes, we were competing, but we were also being cooperative with each other. So we were supporting each other even though we were against each other. So you can enjoy your passion running by yourself, but when you're sharing that passion with others, 
it's just an added bonus. One of the things that made it easier to finish the last Austin Marathon I was in is that at the end of it, there were five or six runners that I was with. And I was really tired, but seeing the other people struggle along with me made it a lot easier to finish. It gave an extra emotional burst. And yeah, my legs still hurt, and they were still in a lot of pain, but seeing the other runners up ahead of me made it easier to join with them and just run on to the finish. William, thank you so much for sharing your story. We enjoyed hearing about your passion, and uh, we'll hear more about other people's passions on the Gene and Dave Show. Wow, that was pretty amazing. And William uh, recently came in first place in an ultra marathon. An ultra marathon is 50 miles. Wow. Now, when, when I, we used to run track when I was in high school. Well, that was before I became paralyzed. But they have a big track. Every high school has a big track. Mm -hmm. That's a quarter mile in circumference. So to run 50 miles, you have to run 200 of these laps. Wow. To put that in perspective. And uh, I can't imagine how he does it. That's a long uh, ways. It really is. And he was telling me about some other... Um, runs he's got coming up and, well uh, he and he was at the boston marathon man yeah. that's that is so hard to believe and actually at the boston marathon where the bomber and all that stuff was i remember when that happened and you know, i remember seeing knowing that william was there i was hoping he was okay and he was he made it out through it but uh, just it, man it, taking the passion that far to go mm -hmm. do the acclaimed boston marathon it, that's fantastic and he's got some more coming up. He's uh, uh, got one coming up at Marble Falls. That's going to be a 30-mile marathon in Marble 30. Falls. And then another 30 um, will be his fourth ultra marathon. Uh, he had to drop out of one because he got injured. Ouch. Uh, yeah. He came in third in his age group at the Prickly Pear. 30 mile and was the first male to finish in the Houston 50 mile ultra. Yeah, that, that is just incredible. Uh, when we were at William's office, he was showing me some of the medals he won. Yeah. And uh, uh, of course, here's a picture of the trophy he, he won is for the uh, ultra marathon, the 50 mile uh, ultra marathon. Uh, just amazing. Um, so, so you couch potatoes out there, just think about William, legally blind, and he's running 50-mile ultra marathons. Right. We're here today with Jennifer McPhail. Jennifer works at ADAPT, but it's probably better to say she lives at ADAPT or with ADAPT. Uh, Jennifer, I've known you for many, many years. Uh, I met you at ADAPT. You're doing advocacy work. Um, tell us how this has become your passion. Well, I sort of just slipped into it because um, I had someone, when I was interested in going to school, tell me, well, this university isn't for you people. You people don't come to our university. And it was an example of many times in my life when someone had discriminated against me and I was angry and I wanted to do something substantive to try to address those instances. And um, I'd seen an article in the um, ADAPT newsletter called Incitement about a protest that was happening at the um, governor's reception room when Ann Richards was governor in 1991, I believe, and um, decided that I would go to that protest. And that's how I got involved with ADAPT. Okay, that's how you got started. Uh, tell us some of the things you do as part of your advocacy efforts. Well, right now I'm working a lot on the local level with access and housing and um, helping people occasionally transition from nursing homes back into the community and um, all sorts of stuff. Well, now, anybody could do this kind of work 
but I've been with you on adapt actions out in when it's been very hot, when it's been really, really cold, and just sitting out long periods of time. It takes lots of effort to do that. And I, I think the only way anyone could do that is if they have a really passion, if they really have a passion for it. And uh, I, I believe you have the, uh, I think the passion that shows in all of your work. Uh, how do you keep it up? I don't know, every once in a while something really cool will happen and you go, all right, well that was totally worth it and I've got to go try to do more. Sometimes it's simply that on a, on a certain issue something is just so wrong that someone did that you just say to yourself, you know, I have to keep this going. And, or every once in a while you'll see um, the work that you've done improve other people's lives and you'll be able to like interact with those people and, and see how much their, their lives have changed and that sort of makes you want to do it more. You say it improves someone else's lives. Um, I think when you talk about someone else, you're talking about perhaps someone else in ADAPT. And it seems to me that ADAPT is really about family. ADAPT is, everyone in ADAPT is a family, part of a family. So when you're doing something for someone else, you're doing something for your family. Yeah, nice. and yourself as well. Um, you know, when my fellow ADAPT members' lives gets better, so does mine, and so will people um, throughout the community. You know, hopefully forget it. You know, hopefully some of the things that we put in place, actually we can keep in place and improve upon without too much of a fight. It seems like um, especially recently, a lot of the great things that, that we've won are under attack, you know, by um, opposing viewpoints. So we have to keep fighting for the, for the things that we've, we've just won. But hopefully we'll be able to advance the issues forward enough that people will have um, progress well into the future. Tell us about some of the advocacy work you do with the legislature, or this past session, I should say. Well, this last session was really brutal. Uh, all the cuts to people's attendant services, um, there were a lot of proposed cuts that could have been very devastating to every program. So we're expecting some sorts of cuts, but um, we're kind of outreaching to people to let us know, you know, if their attendant services are, or are being threatened to be cut or they're being reassessed for less hours, to please call us or get in touch with us. Um, our website is www.adapt.org or you can call us at 442-0252. And, and, and you can call from anywhere in the country really, so 512. Oh, that's correct. I'm sorry. 512-442-0252. Because although you, you work locally, you, you also do national. Actions. Tell us about those. Yeah, that's right. Um, we have one coming up, and there's a, going to be a big rally to save Medicaid um, on the 21st of September. That's a Wednesday in Washington, D.C. And if you need more information about that, contact us at that website, um, www.adapt.org, or uh, contact us at our phone number, 512-442-0252. Okay, we talked about some of the national work, state work. I also know you, you've been very active uh, uh, at city councils as well. You, you're all over the place. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you keep up the energy? Uh, insanity helps a little bit. Uh, again, you know, it's that whole, I've got to make this better for myself and for everybody else. Otherwise, if, if we don't do it, no one else is going to really. It's not exactly the most glamour type of job that you can do so there aren't people busting down the doors uh, volunteering to go to city council for eight hours. But if you're into that and you're slightly insane like me and you really want to make things better, you're more than welcome to and you can get in touch with us and you know we're open to everybody, um, disabled and non-disabled alike and it takes a lot of people to make this work um, and it's a great thing, it's a great experience. Um, there's nothing like the, the national actions, that that's what we call our protest. There's absolutely nothing like it in the world, and you can attest to that. It's sort of this huge ball of humanity working toward one goal, and everybody is a diverse 
you know, comes from diverse backgrounds and all the, all the things that you hear about a melting pot, that's what ADAPT really is. And we have to live together and work together in a very intimate situation. A lot of times, you know, when you're protesting, you're out in the physical elements and you're doing a lot of hard work. And sometimes you go to jail for civil disobedience and there's no greater way to really learn about what a person is made of than in those moments. I, and, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that because, I mean, obviously this is your passion. Not everybody can do it. It's it's not for the faint of heart. It's it's not for the fair weather advocate. Yeah. This is for diehard advocates. Uh, they are willing to sacrifice and endure a lot. And uh, I I thank you for all that you're you're doing for all of us. Um, well, it's fun too. Don't get me wrong. I, there's nothing better than in those moments when you see the opposition go, what do I do now? Or holy crap, just give them what they want and they'll go away. <laughs> you know, those are great moments when, when people realize, hey, either, you know, they realize, hey, they're right or, oh God, what do I do? And they're equally as fun, but in different ways. And it's made a lot of change, and if it didn't make, if it didn't result in the change that we wanted, none of us would do it. Um, but it's it's been the inspiration of Money Follows the Person, which is the project or the program that um, helps people transition from institutions back into the community using the money that the state would have spent on the institutional care on attendant services. So let's talk about this for a second. If someone uh, becomes very disabled, uh, they may be faced with going into a nursing home where, say, Medicaid dollars or, or government dollars might be used to fund their stay here, but uh, you and ADAPT are advocating for community services to pay for a, attendant care so that person can stay in the community. That's correct. And what we found is that um, overall, attendant services based in the community are about two-thirds the cost of what it would cost to institutionalize somebody. And the care in your life in general is much higher quality because you can come and go as you please and do what you like and be who you are without having to live by the institution's rules. You could be your own person. Jennifer, is there anything that I haven't asked you about that uh, uh, you'd like to tell us? Because, I mean, certainly a passion is, uh, uh, well, I mean, it, well, it takes up all your energy or it takes all your time. Uh, and certainly you, you, you sacrifice a lot. You could have been other places doing other things. And certainly been doing a lot easier things. But, uh, well, success does a lot to fuel passions, no matter what the passion is. And if you're not passionate about it, don't do it. And, you know, there, there's nothing quite like seeing somebody realize that they're worth fighting for, you know, that, that they have a lot to give and that they deserve to be equal. That sort of fans those flames in each of us when we're together as a group and we have success. It just makes you want to achieve more. And I haven't found anything like it. If I found anything that was as satisfying as doing what we were, were doing, I would have done it because it probably would have been easier. But most of the things that are really worth doing, that really impact people, you know, they're not convenient. And to know that we we've played a role in um, helping people transition back into the community and restart their lives, and not be warehoused away. That's a very satisfying feeling. Or being able to uh, roll down the sidewalk that we've advocated for and know that everybody uses that, regardless of whether or not they're disabled. If you're a pedestrian, whether you use your feet or your wheels, you probably use a sidewalk that ADAPT is advocated for. And you know, you get to change the course of history in some small ways and in some very large uh, huge impactful ways that you know will um, impact thousands of lives. So how many times in, in your life will you get to do that? Change the course of history. It doesn't happen very often. Good point. And uh, largely because of the death efforts, 
I think it's fair to say uh, because of the depth of efforts, Austin has been consistently rated one of the top three most accessible cities in the country. Yeah. So thanks to ADAPT and people like yourself. Um, it def we definitely still have things that we need to improve upon. And if people you know, have things that they want to work on with us, they're more than welcome to get involved. And we have a, a project called the Tuesday Access Club that um, meets every Tuesday at noon and we work on various um, accessibility issues. And so if people are interested in getting involved, um, our address is Great. So you, you folks saw the address listed here uh, underneath us, and it's also on our web page. Uh, just go to thechainanddaveshow.com and look up people's passions. And when you get to that uh, show, that address will be listed, uh, and Jennifer's contact information will be listed as well. Thanks for joining us, folks. Thank, Thank you. you Thanks very much. Wow, Dave. Well, you and I have both um, have been and still are advocates. Right. But, but Jennifer, like you said, she really takes it to a new level. She's kind of like uh, Virginia in the beginning where, you know, the bird watcher that gets up early in the morning and goes mm -hmm. all day long. Yeah. Well, that's Jennifer, man. Her, she lives her passion all day. She gets up early and goes to the talk to the Senate or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, um, protesting, holding signs out on the street corners in the snow, whatever, she's there. <laughs> whatever it takes to get her message across, Jennifer's is there. So I guess in conclusion, if you have a passion, get out there and do it. Yes. And if you don't, exactly. go find one. <laughs> exactly. But you've got to get out there. You've got to do something so that you can find your passion and find happiness in life. I would say that we've we've discovered the meaning of life here on the Gene and Dave Show. Truer words were never <laughs> spoken. <laughs> to live out your passion. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, folks. Thanks for watching. And if you need any more notes about this show or any of our previous episodes, please go to the com and find out more information. And email us if you'd like, because we'd love to hear your story and find out what your passion is. Bye for now. Adios. for mom once a week is great, but she needs help every day. Dad needs a ride to the doctor, but you can't miss work again. And can mom afford to have help preparing her meals? We know what you're going through. Amerigroup has a plan for people with Medicaid that helps them get the services they need to live at home. Amerigroup, choose us for helping your loved ones live at home. Call 1-800-964-2777.